Um, today, uh, we have presenters Thea Curdy, who is the Vice President of Designable Environments, um, and Sage Lovell, who is the founder of Deaf Spectrum. Um, so we're very pleased to have both these uh, presenters here today uh, speaking with us. Um, we will hand things over to them in just a minute, but we have to cover a few housekeeping items before we get started. Uh, first of all, you can hear us, but we can't hear you. Your microphones have been disabled for this webinar, uh, but you can use your speakers or headphones to listen in. You can adjust the sound by clicking on the speaker icon at the top of the meeting. We will be offering closed captioning throughout the webinar today as well. The closed captioning will be happening at the bottom of the screen where participants can change the font type, size, and color. Um, can a participant confirm using the chat box that they can see the closed captioning box at the bottom of our meeting room? Great, thank you so much. Um, a couple more things. Um, we will be recording this session. Um, so we will be emailing out that link to that recording along with a survey following the webinar. We ask that you complete the survey so we can continue to improve our learning series for Creative Spaces. Um, lastly, uh, we will have roughly 10 to 15 minutes at the end of the webinar to answer questions. Please use the chat box on the, or at the bottom right of your screen to type in your questions and we will get to as many as possible. Please note uh, that our chat box function at the bottom right of your screen is not accessible using a screen reader. If you do have any questions for presenters, please email them to erin at artsfieldontario.ca. Uh, that's E-R-I-N at arts, A-R-T-S-B-U-I-L-D-O-N-T-A-R-I-O dot C-A. Uh, and we will get, we, we will ask uh, them during the question and answer period and get to as many questions uh, from everyone uh, as we can in that time. Uh, in case you haven't heard of Arts Build Ontario, we're a nonprofit art service organization that provides programs and learning opportunities that help make Ontario's creative spaces more sustainable. One of our programs is the Learning Series, which is a series of webinars, workshops, and resources that support our core programs. This is our first out of six webinars in the Learning Series that will focus on accessibility. These webinars will focus on accessibility and creative spaces based on the Design for Public Spaces standard as part of uh, the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disability Act, or otherwise the AODA. Uh, the webinar will explain how creative spaces need to meet accessible building standards and explore ways creative spaces can go beyond the standards, taking into account uh, physical accessibility and experiential accessibility. The webinars uh, will be supported by a toolkit for creative spaces around the topic of accessibility, which will be released in spring 2019. Uh, ABO would also like to thank its Accessibility Advisory Committee for informing the webinar topics, speakers, and upcoming toolkit for creative spaces in Ontario. Um, a note from myself, uh, you will notice many of the topics in this webinar series will be discussing a different aspect of accessibility as it relates to creative spaces. Now, first off, many of us might be wondering what defines a creative space. For the purposes of our programs and the network of arts organizations that we serve at Arts Build Ontario, our definition of creative spaces is a space that is actively serving creative industries. We are moving outside the concept of traditional purpose-built structures to allow for more possibilities when it comes to the creation of art space in our communities. For example, in addition to theaters, galleries, museums, and media studios, we are seeing more and more new takes on creative spaces, such as libraries, sacred spaces, and creative hubs, just to name a few. As we move through the topic of accessibility in creative spaces within this webinar series, it is important to understand that your space is unique to your environment community and organization. A public municipality or municipally owned and operated space is going to have different legislative requirements than a small nonprofit arts organization housed in a heritage space with under 20 staff. We should also acknowledge that each space has its own unique set of resources. So while not every creative space has a designated accessibility manager, and if you do that is 100% great, uh, we hope this webinar series will offer best practices to support your knowledge around the AODA design for public spaces standard and how creative spaces can feel empowered and go beyond 
the legislation to offer accessible and inclusive space for all. Um, now, uh, I would like to introduce our guest presenters for today's webinar. First up, we have Thea Curdy, who is the Vice President uh, of Designable Environments. She's an accessibility specialist and dynamic speaker known for her enthusiasm for teaching. She has presented workshops, keynote addresses, and lectures at local and international events for design students, professionals, building owners, and policymakers. From the human rights code to evidence-based design and increased marketability, Curdy shares her passion for how accessibility is fundamental to successful architecture. She is also an architectural technologi technologi technologist, uh, REIC uh, affiliate member, and registered accessibility specialist with Gates. Upcoming presentations of hers include uh, the TEDx Mississauga 2019 Demystify, are we creating accessible buildings and places in Mississauga, Ontario? It's actually happening this Saturday and tickets are still available. Um, and uh, the Interior Design Show 2019 in Toronto, um, topics will include designing for the future accessibility in urban planning and accessibility and design panel discussion following. And she'll also be at the Abilities Expo in Toronto, speaking on living in place and accessible housing. Our second presenter is Sage Lovell. Uh, they are the founder of Dex, Deaf Spectrum. Sweet Sage is a deaf, femme, queer, and non-binary artist. Before moving to Toronto, Sage lived in Washington, D.C. to attend God, Godelet University, uh, the only educational institution served to accommodate the needs of deaf students in the world. The experience transformed their life. There, Sage studied both psychology and theater, realizing that accessibility was uh, more than 20 plus years behind in Canada, Sage returned to their roots and focused on advocacy. These past five years, Sage has worked with various communities in several capacities, developing meaningful work that continues to evolve. With Sage's many talents, they were able to incorporate their passions of media, language, theater, and accessibility into works of art. Uh, these multitude of experiences led Sage to become one of the co-founders of this Deaf Spectrum, a collective established to promote the accessible usage of American Sign Language, um, ASL. Currently, Sage is working on a project called Deaf What, um, along with Deaf talent uh, photographer Alice Lowe to document 50 Deaf folks across Canada with the support of Tangled Arts and Disability. Sage also works as a writer, actor, performance interpreter, and community facilitator. So welcome to you both. Um, I'd like to now turn things over to Thea, who's going to get us started uh, with uh, the first half of our webinar. So over to you, Thea. Thank you very much, Alex. Um, it's such an honor and a pleasure to be a part of this webinar series. Uh, and welcome to everybody who's here um, as a part of the webinar. Um, my job today is to introduce you to how the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act relates to the built environment and give you a broader spectrum understanding of what the entire legislation is meant to be accomplishing. So the agenda I wanted to cover today was to talk a little bit about what exactly a disability is and how we think about it is very important. Then I'll review quickly what old thinking or the approach used to be versus what our new thinking is. Then I'll cover why we should be thinking about accessibility. And uh, the fourth thing will be accessibility in the law. The fifth will be how change is happening in Canada and, and in Ontario. The sixth will then cover resources related to the AODA. And uh, the seventh thing will be to give you access to resources beyond the AODA. So hopefully all of that will be useful to you. So let's get right into this. What is a disability? Well, I love this picture. I made this picture because I really felt that so much of what we discuss about accessibility really doesn't remember that people with disabilities are not only the largest minority group that we have, but it's a minority group that we can all join. It's the minority of everyone. The reality is that we all face a lifetime of changing needs and abilities. So if we currently don't have a disability, we're all in illness, accident, or aging away from uh, developing one. So it's better designed to be thinking about this from that kind of perspective. 
Unfortunately, a lot of approaches in the built environment are still really only focusing on accommodating the needs for people who are using wheelchairs. And perhaps that's unsurprising given that the international symbol of accessibility is a person in a wheelchair and perhaps even a static image. You might have seen the more dynamic images that are starting to happen with the forward movement. But if we thought about the totality of the possible experiences and abilities people might have, we might have been forgetting about blindness and low vision, about brain injuries, about people who are deaf, deafened, or hard of hearing like myself. Well, we might forget about learning disabilities, which is something I also have, um, attention deficit, hyperactive disorders, medical disabilities, physical disabilities, psychiatric disabilities, speech and language disabilities. So when I start talking about how many people might actually have disabilities, one of the things people often come back with is, where are they? Well, like myself, 70% of people with disabilities have what we consider to be invisible disabilities because we don't use something like a mobility device, like a wheelchair, or we don't use a white cane that is obvious just by looking at us. So sometimes it's even harder because people don't recognize we have a disability or maybe don't believe us. So the old thinking around accommodation or inclusion was to really focus on if we have any barriers that exist, we will try to accommodate people with disabilities once they're discovered. Or if you like to think about it a different way, we create the problems with the design of the buildings or the software or whatever. We're focusing on buildings a little bit more today, but it really is everything. And then someone with a disability might come along and then we'll see if we can accommodate them or give them a shoehorn to try to get them to fit into something they were really, never really designed to fit into. So that was the old way of doing it, which was expensive and hard and difficult and frustrating probably for everybody. So the new way of thinking is to move on to something what we call universal design. And I'm starting to see this term pop up in a lot of places. People say our goal is to make this universally designed. But what does that mean? Well, Google will tell you if you do a search, um, but it really is about designing for everybody. In our company, we talk about it designing for people from the ages of five to 95 and everything in between. It's about a range. But a good example of something that's not in the built environment that we can use as inspiration is Apple. So the company Apple introduced the iPhone and the th problem with their new phone was that it didn't have any buttons. So for people who were sighted, no problem. They didn't realize it was a barrier for many people, but particularly people who are blind. So Apple, be made aware of this, took this back and became a global leader in universal design by creating a screen reader that they included for free in all of their products. Now that's a very different approach because in the past it would have been aftermarket and you would have had to pay for it. So they were really taking responsibility and created something amazing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to quickly review with you three reasons for uh, your designs to be accessible. The first is the business case, the second is the legal case, and the third is the social case. So we'll start with the business case. How does this make sense from a money perspective? Well, the demand is growing for universal design to be used, not only as an outcome for uh, the goals of a company or an organization, but it also is because we're continuing and this, it, the demand is continuing to grow because people with disabilities, as we said, are the minority of everybody and because our population is aging. In fact, most people are surprised to learn that a thousand people a day are turning 65 in Canada and at 65 we have about 40% of the population reporting disabilities. Barriers in your built spaces or in any of the policies that you have reduce the number of people who can come to your uh, facilities. So for example, if you had a restaurant that has two steps at the front door, think about the market that you're losing, not only for people who use mobility devices, but also the friends that they might be having dinner with or people who are using strollers. If it's hard for people to get in, they might not come or how we have used audio announcements at transit stops initially because people who are blind couldn't see where they were, but how it also helps people to try to look through a crowd and they can't see the street or if there's snow and the bad weather or if it's dark outside. So accommodation from a business perspective is a smart idea. In fact, it is very smart. 
The Canadian Conference Board of Canada in 2018 published a report that we're seeing here on the screen that was reported by Global News showing that the Canadian uh, gross domestic product stands to gain $17 billion by 2030 by improving disability access. Ontario's population in 2018 was about $14.2 million. The Canadian Survey on Disability, also from 2018, shows that 22% of Canadians now report having at least one disability. So if we took that 22% and applied it to our Ontario population, that means about 3.1 million people in Ontario benefit from accommodation. So if we now move on to our, our second point, how does the AODA apply with the law? So AODA, as Alex mentioned, stands for the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act. The goal of the legislation is to make Ontario accessible by 2025. That's six years from now. That's important for our, our planning so that we know that. We're, it's based on the idea of providing equity, dignity, and respect for everyone. There are five areas of requirements defined underneath the AODA, and they're all organized in something called the Integrated Accessibility Standard. In that standard, we find there are requirements for customer service, information and communication, employment, transportation, and finally, the design of public spaces, which has the built environment pieces in it, although, of course, there are implications for built environment in the other sections as well. So if we understand the law, we understand that you're, you have accommodation requirements for customer service training, and that means training your staff. There's lots of good free resources out there. There's requirements for information and communication. So if you have a website or if you're producing printed material, um, you would be providing under the legislation, if someone were to ask you for an alternative format, you might be providing something with larger print or braille, or uh, a Word version of a PowerPoint presentation, for example, um, including alt text uh, for your images. And then for the employment part of the standard, you're making your hiring practices accessible, so that both the application and the interview process. Now, of course, you probably have to think about then your staff spaces being accessible, but that's not covered by the legislation. Under the AODA, the part that deals mostly with the built environment is, as I mentioned, the design of public spaces. Now, the design of public spaces isn't the only thing that we look to in Ontario law. The other piece of legislation that we look to is the Ontario Building Code, also known as the OBC. And within the OBC, we have a section specifically dedicated to accessibility, although there are other parts that relate to it, but the part in the OBC related to accessibility is part 3.8. So now you know and you're knowledgeable about what those things are. So what's the last part of this analysis is thinking about the social case. Well, the social case makes a lot of sense, right? It's one, it's the right thing to do. Two, barriers that hurt people with disabilities or limit people with disabilities might hurt or limit anyone. And obviously dignity and respect are integral to making sure that everybody can participate and enjoy. So I just wanted to show you, and one of the resources we're going to give you is the Illustrated Guide to the Design of Public Spaces, which I was one of the uh, lead authors for, although it was a huge uh, project and many people contributed. And what we have on the screen is the table of contents, which looks at the exterior path of travel, the recreational trails, beach access routes, many of these things you're not going to need, uh, outdoor public and uh, eating areas, outdoor play spaces, accessible parking, and then obtaining services. And then there's a piece also about maintenance. So of all of that, most buildings are focusing on the exterior path of travel. How do you get to your front door? Do you have any outdoor eating areas as a part of your facilities? And if you do, the AODA requires public consultation. Do you have any outdoor play spaces for all of those kids that might be coming if they need to burn off a little steam? And this also requires some public consultation. That might sound intimidating. It's really not that hard. Um, if you have accessible parking, there are different types of parking that you have to provide. A type A, which is van size, and type B, which is car size. Although any car can actually park in a type A uh, size spot. 
And then the things related inside the building are related to the obtaining services. And there are only three of them that the AODA talks about. One is the any service counter that you may have. Two, if you have fixed queuing guides, what are the queuing requirements? And number three, if you have any waiting areas with fixed seating, how do you make that accessible? If we look very quickly then at the Ontario Building Code, which is the other piece of the built environment, there are limited accessibility requirements in that document, as I mentioned in section 3.8. So the question often is, can we build a building that fully complies with the OBC and the AODA and not have it be fully inclusive? Well, you may have seen that some people have said this, and uh, people often ask me why. And my answer is that it, it's because most of our legislation really is still focusing, as I mentioned earlier, on people with mobility devices like wheelchairs, and we're not solving the design issues for the full range of abilities people have. So it does create, uh, give an opportunity for more creativity. And there's a hierarchy to our laws that many people um, aren't unaware of. Um, the Ontario Human Rights Code actually prevails over the OBC and the AODA. It's the higher law. So one of the difficulties can be that meeting the technical requirements for a new building or renovation that meet the OBC and the AODA does not necessarily mean you're meeting all the obligations under the Ontario Human Rights Code. This, uh, as reported by the Ontario Human Rights Tribunal, has caused confu confusion for some business owners or are people who are running facilities or events um, on the understanding of the, what the duty to accommodate actually looks like. So what we're focusing on here is that the, the technical requirements from our legislation uh, are a little bit different perhaps than what the Ontario Human Rights uh, Code is doing trying to protect discrimination overall. Again, creativity is our friend here. So if we looked at this also in context of both the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms um, that was changed over 30 years ago and applies to all government organizations um, which apply or deliver government services and it guarantees equality without discrimination for people with disabilities, right? People with disabilities in Canada are equal citizens. The Ontario Human Rights Code applies to all government and all private businesses, including not-for-profits. Both are meant to guarantee equality for people with disabilities. It means that we ha all have a duty to not create barriers, and we have a duty to remove existing barriers where they exist to the point of undue hardship. And undue hardship in its simplest explanation is you would have to demonstrate trying to make it accessible would bankrupt you. So it is quite a high level, but the good news is 80% of accessibility is very easy to do. It just takes some planning. So as mentioned earlier, the Ontario Human Rights Tribunal um, has primacy. Um, I wanted to provide this slide so that everything I said, if you didn't catch it in the captioning, you would have it here as well. Um, and we want to just make sure that business owners and people who are running facilities are very clear um, what the responsibilities are. So what's happening in Ontario is representative of what's happening in Canada, and it's all great. We now have, for the first time in the history, the Minister of Persons with Disabilities, who at the federal level is Carla Qualtro, who is working on the Accessible Canada Act, known as Bill C-81. Um, it could be coming soon, maybe as soon as this spring, it's right now with the Senate. And in Ontario, this is great, we have a Minister of Seniors and Accessibility, um, uh, Raymond Cho. Uh, who's heading up uh, a lot of really great work, and we're excited to see where this is going to go. So we've provided resources for you here. Um, these links will be made available to you here and as well as in the tool toolkit. And the, this first page relates to the um, resources for the AODA specifically. So what do you need to do for your customer service, if you're maybe a little rusty on that? Uh, what do you need to do for information communication, and where can you get help for that? What are your requirements under AODA employment? And finally, the big piece about the built environment, we're providing a link to an illustrated guide that which was developed by uh, and with the Accessibility Directorate of Ontario.
And finally, we've provided additional resources. So if you wanted to get a link to what does the building code say about accessibility, there's a website for that. If you wanted to be up to date on what our Canadian Standards Association is doing about accessibility, and the National Building Code is looking to the CSA standard, we're going to provide um, information about that. Unfortunately, it's not free. So, But there's also great free resources from the CNIB and a document called Clearing Our Path. And the City of Mississauga, like many municipalities, so look to your own municipalities, but the City of Mississauga has a free facility accessibility design standards which are also known as FADs, which are based on universal design principles. And the great thing about this one, although many of them are amazing and, and very consistent with each other, is that this was designed using also the OBC and the ODA. So it doesn't conflict in any way. It's a good, solid resource. And if you're not familiar with hashtag AXS chat or access chat, on Twitter or social media, I wanted to give you this uh, wonderful thought to conclude with. Dignity is inexplicably or inextricably linked with respect and acceptance. When we respect the people we deal with and accept them as equals, dignity is a natural outcome. Access Chat is an amazing resource if you're not very familiar with issues for people with disabilities, and I hope you enjoy it. Thank you. so much, Thea. Um, that was really great and informative. Uh, now I'm going to turn things over to Sage Level. Um, so I just ask for uh, one moment as uh, we just turn on our webcam uh, and get everyone set up. Hello, everyone. My name is Sage Level. Uh, the voice that you're hearing is actually my interpreter because I'm a deaf individual. I'm using American Sign Language to communicate. I don't speak. I use a visual language, sign language, so I have an interpreter here. I founded Deaf Spectrum as a way to advocate for accessibility for deaf Ontarians and across Canada as well. I'm very excited to be here and presenting to you today. So to begin, I want to talk about deafness, what deafness is. It encompasses a variety of levels of hearing loss. Some individuals are born deaf, some lose their hearing over time. Um, some of them, as they become older, sometimes it happens very young. Sometimes you may see the word deaf in literature as a capital D or as a small d, and there is a difference between the two. The capital D refers to people who are culturally deaf. These individuals use sign language, so they don't speak for themselves generally, and they're a part of the deaf community. And they're very proud to be part of the deaf community. Small d is from a more medical perspective. It's speaking to the idea that someone has lost their hearing. They may be using a cochlear implant. Uh, it may speak to speech language pathology, pathology and therapy. So that one, so that one will include um, another group of people. So when you put the two together, you can see that we're talking about a very large and unique community. That includes individuals of varying needs. Sorry, I'm signing a little fast today, so sometimes the interpreter may take a moment to catch up. Um, sign language is uh, a language in its own right. It has grammars, it has a specific syntax, specific structure. So as the interpreter is working, the interpreter is actually working between two languages, just like a spoken interpreter would. Speaking to language for many, many years, Sign language was not recognized as a language. It was judged, it was seen to be um, less, less powerful than English and something that wasn't really something to be noticed or respected. Um, American Sign Language includes five parameters, parameters, pardon the interpreter, hand shape, movement, location. Location could be in front of your chest, it could be on your face, it could be out in space in front of you where your hands are. Palm orientation is talking to where your palm is facing, whether it's out or down, left to the right, and facial expression. Facial expression is incredibly important in sign language, and it speaks to the intonation of the sign language, kind of similar to how your voice uh, speaks intonation and shares emotion and goes up and down if you're angry or what have you. We have that on our face instead of in our voice. This next slide is speaking to two terms. Maybe you're familiar with them, perhaps you're not. The first one is autism. 
autism is a systemic oppression that benefits those who can hear by oppressing those individuals who do not hear. The second word that we're seeing used more and more is phonocentrism. Again, it's an oppression, systemic oppression, in which spoken language is considered better, more superior than other types of communications. Next term I have on here is hearing privilege, which is speaking to those people who are not deaf, who can hear, and who don't ever experience autism. So the odd time you may have someone respond to a deaf person in a situation and say, you know, you're, you're oppressing other people by saying that, but this is suggesting that as hearing privilege plays a part, those people who can hear don't experience this oppression just by virtue of the fact that they can hear and they are the majority. An example of what this may look like, a person who is not deaf has their choice to go to a theater show, to go to a movie and relax and enjoy it any movie they want, any time they buy a ticket, they can go. A deaf individual has to think about whether interpreters will be there. Will there be captioning? And their options are very, very limited. Deaf gain is the opposite. It's speaking to benefits that we experience as deaf individuals. So for example, there is a large deaf community. It's very diverse, it's very dynamic, and we can be a part of that. We can be a part of a community that is all around the world gives us a chance to meet deaf people from varying countries. And also we have the chance to travel and meet others. Often what happens is you find the deaf individuals in other countries and you never have to pay for accommodations because although we may sign different languages, we're deaf and we have that in common and often people are very open and welcoming to having us stay at their home when we travel. Deafness is an invisible disability, which was spoken to before. If you think about it, you know, how do you identify someone who's deaf? If I'm not signing and I don't wear hearing aids, which I don't, and I'm out walking down the street, it's not obvious that I'm deaf. So sometimes what may happen is someone behind me tries to tell me something. They try to let me know something's happening, or they try and ask me a question and they think I'm ignoring them because they can't tell that I'm deaf just from looking at it. Until they see suddenly that I use sign language or they see someone who has a hearing aid or someone who has a cochlear implant that then makes that disability visible. Some deaf people don't use sign language. Some deaf people may be able to speak quite well. So they may pass actually as someone who can hear, but they still require accommodations even with their disabilities. An important point to note is many people who are deaf don't identify as disabled. They don't say that they are a disabled person. So often we see a bit of a division between the deaf community and the disability community. So there are partnerships there that definitely could be developed. Um, and at the same time, deaf people do benefit from disability benefits, for example, OPSP and those sorts of things. So there are connections back and forth between the two. Also, we see support for deaf artists through a variety of disability grants and programs. They're still limited, though. So again, partnerships with disability communities, organizations are important and need to be nurtured. Some folks who identify as culturally deaf do also fit under the umbrella of disability just by, on, by virtue of the fact that they may have other disabilities. They may have mental illness. They may be dealing with other illnesses or other physical disabilities in addition to being a deaf person. So in that case, suddenly we're thinking about larger groups of accommodations that are required for individuals because they have more than one identity. They have more than one disability. And again, I can't speak for all. We can't say all deaf people are the same. Some deaf people will identify as someone with a disability. But generally speaking, when you're in the deaf community, the majority of the individuals you meet will say that they're not disabled, they're deaf. Representation for deaf artists in our community is very important. As a deaf individual growing up, you don't see people represented who are like you in the arts, in mainstream media. It's very lacking. Often what you do see is people who can hear, who take on the roles 
the uh, deaf people in India. Uh, but deaf uh, people have the right to be inspired and uh, to have role models just like anyone else. So that is why representation is incredibly important. We have stories that need to be shared and we need those opportunities to share them. It's really important that the deaf community is used as a resource when people are speaking about deaf people, they're writing about them, or they're referring to them in some way. That is a resource to go to those people and get their perspectives. If you're writing something about deaf people, take it to a deaf individual and get them to look it over and make sure that it's appropriate. Otherwise, there's harm that can be caused, oppression that happens, sometimes without the intention. Often, those folks who are culturally deaf use interpretation services. This could be for a meeting, for a webinar, for a lecture, for a group discussion. Any place where you have people who are not deaf and people who do not sign, and at least one individual who does sign is one interpretation. Now, sometimes you may see a reference to a deaf interpreter, which we call a DI. Deaf interpreters can be used for performance pieces. They will work through a whole script and translate it into American Sign Language. And these days we really advocate for offering the opportunity to deaf interpreters to interpret performance, whether that be in theaters, on stage. It's their native language. So when you think about language, those who grew up speaking a certain language as a native, language user are the most fluent, and that is the same case in the deaf community. Deaf individuals who grew up signing, they are the fluent signers, unlike interpreters and hearing folks. So to include the deaf community, there are a variety of things you can do. You provide resources in sign language, in American Sign Language, as well as LSQ, which is Langue des Signes Québécois, Sign Language in Quebec. Consulting with deaf experts or hiring deaf individuals to take up leadership roles in projects that include them or their community. If you don't know anything about deaf culture, but you are writing something or doing something to refer to the deaf community, using the community as a resource and asking people from the community to speak to your work. Also using inclusive language. So things such as saying hearing impaired is uh, can be an insulting comment toward deaf people because it suggests that they're broken. Inclusivity and diversity is always a good thing, but we want to avoid tokenism and bringing in a deaf person so that we can say that we have one. Clear communication and transparency is incredibly important also within the deaf community amongst each other and also between communities. Also, speak directly to the point that you're trying to make when you're having a conversation with a deaf person. Make your point rather than beating around the bush and sort of being subtle about it or nuanced about it. Often we as deaf people do get straight to the point. If you're not sure of something, ask questions and clarify just to be sure you're on the same page with the individual that you're working with. Creative spaces are changing. We see collaborative creative spaces between deaf individuals and non-deaf individuals. They are happening. Accessibility and accommodations are being provided. Creative spaces that are led by deaf people are also amazing opportunities. Typically in these spaces we see communication happening via sign language and we see literature being created such as poetry. This type of space really prevents cultural appropriation. We have seen people who are not deaf take advantage of the beauty of sign language to create their own art. And it's an art that doesn't come back to improve the deaf community in any way or contribute to the deaf community. We also see that online. Lately, you've seen a lot of this, uh, music videos where individuals are signing music. And often, when we as deaf people look at them, we can tell they haven't used an American Sign Language coach or consulted with anyone deaf just based on what the, the quality of the video and the language that we're seeing. Also in a space that's led by deaf people, it reduces concentration fatigue. When you have deaf people in a space together, 
language flows incredibly smoothly. It's direct back and forth and conversations happen in a very dynamic way. When you have to bring in interpreters and other people who are not deaf, the communication can still be then it takes longer just because not everyone in the room is fluent. So by having fluent signers all together in a room, that concentration fatigue doesn't happen quite as quickly. If you're looking to make a space accessible to deaf individuals, there are some things that you need to think about. Lighting. Make sure that the individuals can see each other. If the room is too dark, that can be a problem. So we need bright lighting. The size of the room can be important as well. Because we're signing, we need space to be able to move our arms and be physical in our space. Um, and often to individuals need to see at least minimum from waist up on a person as they're signing. Uh, the layout of the room. If it's a large room where you have an audience facing all the same way toward one person, it's not always ideal. What's more ideal is having people sitting in a circle so everyone can see everyone else. Because being a visual language, you need to see each person as they're signing. In terms of alerts, mm -hmm. if there was an emergency, if there was a fire alarm, mm -hmm. um, you need to be aware of how those are being shown as well. In, in my case, I actually did. I did experience in my lifetime a house fire, and we didn't have a visual alarm. And I was a deaf individual in that house. Now, I did survive that house fire. But from here on, from that point onward, it was really driven home to me how important those visual alarms are, so I advocate for those. If you're using interpreters, ensure that you're hiring qualified interpreters. Interpreters who are members of CASLI, C-A-S-L-I, a national organization representing sign language interpreters in Canada. The membership is very important. Um, often there are interpreters who aren't members, um, and some of them can be quite qualified, but we're finding more problems these days because CASLI requires that interpreters follow a certain code of ethics, and they recognize those code of ethics, and they are approaching their assignments appropriately and in a qualified professional manner. So you want to hire qualified interpreters for the work that you're looking to have interpreted. Qualified interpreters will show up wearing black, for example, because high contrast is what is needed to allow for people to see them clearly. I think it's also important just to, to reiterate that the people who make up our deaf community, our deaf and hard of hearing community, are individual, and needs and accommodations are as varied as the individuals we're speaking about. Some people may prefer to have live captioning versus a sign language interpreter. It really depends on their preference. So the best thing to do is to ask them what is the best way to accommodate them and not assume. Thank you so much for having me here. At this point, I think we're moving on to the question period, so I'll hand it back over to Alex. Um, it's fine, so you can stay where you are. Um, okay. Um, unfortunately, I've just realized that our video camera has not been working um, as we have anticipated. So. Um, so sorry about that. Um, okay. Yeah. I didn't realize it wasn't running. The whole time. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, we, no, that's okay. That's okay. <laughs> um, I I'm on my uh, colleague's computer and can just see it now, so it it, it is working now. Um, so we have entered into the question and answer period, everyone. Um, if you do have a question you would like to ask uh, Thea or um, Sage at this time, I encourage you to type it into the chat box. Um, uh, we do have about 15 minutes, actually, so I encourage you guys to ask them any questions you might have about your creative space, or if you are creative looking to know what you could ask for in the space that you are using, uh, this is a great time to uh, type in any questions you have. Alternatively, you can also email your questions, and if you're not able to use the chat box, um, you can uh, email questions into Erin at artsbuildontario.ca. Um, and she'll be happy to uh, get back to you and you can answer those throughout the webinar um, now. Now, it looks like we do have a few uh, uh, typing in questions um, at the moment, so I'll wait for those to come through and then we can um, get started. <laughs> 
So the first question that we have coming in is from Melissa. And she's asking, are there examples of creative spaces that you know of um, that are great examples of everything that has been discussed here today? Um, so Sage, I'll, I'll get you to answer this question first and then Thea, you can follow and then we'll get to the other questions. Mm -hmm. If we're speaking to Toronto, the Deaf Culture Center is a very um, amazing space, white walls, very large. Um, the setup of the whole room is uh, able to be moved around. So a variety of, uh, you can set it up in a variety of ways. The, the, I think the thing about that space that I really like is how flexible it is. So it can be adjusted for anyone who's coming into the space and they move yeah. around quite a bit. So it's not a static space. It's important, I think, to have a space that is flexible because you never know who's going to come into it. The Deaf Culture Center is um, in the distillery district here in Toronto. Um, and like I say, it has white walls. It's very bright when you go in, there's lots of light. All the colors are very neutral. And all the, all the doors are glass as well. So you could see through, you could actually even have a conversation. One thing we I like about it is you can have a conversation with someone inside through sign language and I don't actually have to go in to have the conversation. I can just look in the door and say something in passing. Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, Thank you, it's Sage. a really important uh, question yeah. about heritage you have any structures. Thoughts? We've seen a significant change in particularly the last couple of years where the conversation around heritage and accessibility has made a shift. Uh, in the past, heritage really ruled the roost, and we would try to fit accessibility in as much as possible, but often accessibility was compromised to uh, protect the heritage. What we've seen in the last couple of years, particularly I think with the rulings around the Ontario Human Rights Tribunal, is that we're starting with a different question. How are we using this space? So if we're using the space as um, a museum piece, then the, the piece that we're looking at remains untouched to the greatest extent possible, and people are really coming to look at it. So they're really being kept out of the space. Uh, so we make everything around the space very accessible, and the space itself is very limited for accessibility because it's really not going to have people um, and going into it. Uh, the change has been uh, that where we're seeing uh, heritage spaces that are in active use, then the answer to the question is, this space is being used for people, which means that it should be available and usable by all people, and that to not do so could be interpreted as a form of uh, discrimination. So uh, now, when we're working on heritage projects, we're working on making sure the accessibility is great and as inclusive as possible. And what we're doing is we're respecting the heritage to the greatest extent possible. How do we uh, preserve what's valuable without compromising people's ability to access? 
Uh, yeah, I think I accidentally answered this, the last question. <laughs> um, yeah, I think uh, heritage and accessibility uh, in the built environment um, is an opportunity for some real creativity. Uh, how do we balance things? How do we preserve things? Um, how do you, for example, put in a ramp into a building that has, you know, eight stairs at the front entrance? and still convey uh, a sense of inclusion, respect, and equality. Uh, these are real challenges that buildings that I'm working on now um, and we have worked on in the past uh, have tried to address. Um, it's not always easy. Uh, creating new accessible structures uh, is really not very expensive at all. If you start early enough in the process, and this is an important point for building owners and building users uh, or people who are renting, uh, accessibility cannot be started soon enough. If you're planning for your accessible spaces, making sure that you have the space requirements, uh, which Sage was talking about, uh, from additional accessibility standards to try to meet your human rights code uh, beyond code requirements, uh, that's something you can do long before you've hired an architect. Um, the other thing that, uh, and I'm going to be talking about this in my TED talk, is you know often people go into something trying to design or create or renovate and they put in additional accessibility standards which they didn't include when they were budgeting and they didn't include when they were space planning and the architects and contractors we're working with are um, left between a rock and a hard place uh, or when they're bidding for the project it's in a competitive bid environment if they do more than code minimum they're scared they're going to lose the job because the job's not awarded on accessibility so there's um, the recommendations that we're giving you as a part of additional things to consider are part of the resources that I mentioned earlier in the uh, presentation. So those would be made available to you later. But things that Sage was talking about are, well, there's so much more than we have to do for particularly the deaf community um, and for people who are hard of hearing uh, like myself. Getting the lighting levels right at a service counter so that you can lip read, as I often do, or thinking about a presentation space that has a space for the ASL interpreter or for an additional cart screen in addition to the PowerPoint presentation screen are not something that we're often including in their design requirements. So get, just getting that on people's radar really early means that it's included really early and included in the budget, included in the space, so that we're not left trying to figure out, oh, now how do we do it? So I hope that helps. It, it is tricky with heritage.
No, unfortunately. I think